This episode is sponsored by Shug the Dug Productions. Hello and welcome to Film Pro Productivity, the podcast that helps film professionals and other creative people to live a more focused, effective and happy life. My name is Carter Ferguson and this is episode 43, The Law of Success in 16 Lessons, Part 4. And welcome back to this, the fourth part of my series on Napoleon Hill's powerful book, The Law of Success in 16 Lessons. And if you've not heard the previous parts, then I'd really strongly advise you to go back and check out episodes 40, 41 and 42 before listening to this one, because it's just going to be easier if you listen to them in context and in order. My aim with this series is to just give you a fleeting glimpse of the power that lies within the pages of the book and to help you open your mind to the possibilities that Napoleon Hill presents there. And I won't always identify sections of quoted text within these episodes and it's purely for streamlining purposes, but much of the content is my interpretation or direct quotation of Napoleon Hill himself. The main change that I make is in neutralising the gender, not all the time, but just every now and again, because I want to make the lessons as accessible and relevant for today's audience as Hill intended it to be in 1928. And this is a very big episode with a veritable Aladdin's cave of new ideas, observations and advice. I would give this next lesson an episode of its own if I could, but instead what I advise you to do is maybe pause between the lessons or listen again to take it all in. I've augmented it with additional information from Hill's 1954 film as well as it adds a lot to the equation which the original book leaves out. So hang on to your breeks and stand by for Lesson 10, A Pleasing Personality. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. In this chapter, Hill encourages us to arrange the outward appearance through which the nature of our personality is expressed so that it will attract and not repel. He wants us to realise that our personalities can become what he calls master salesmen working on our behalf. If we look at successful people and wonder how they managed it, but overlook the importance of analysing their methods and the price they had to pay in careful, well-organised preparation and presentation, then we are not seeing the full picture. Hill kicks all this off by describing personality as the sum of our characteristics and appearances which distinguish us from all others. The clothes we wear, the lines on our face, the tone of our voice and the thoughts we think all constitute parts of our personality. And by far the most important part of our personality is the part that is not visible, our character. Of course, whether your personality is attractive or not is another matter entirely. Italian designer Alessandro Michel says the way you dress is an expression of your personality. And that's yet another point that Hill makes in this chapter. He says the same thing my mum did when I was going for a job interview or meeting someone for the first time, that people form first impressions of you from your outward appearance. I highlight this here as a reminder to us all that things like this matter, maybe not to you, but to the people you meet and work with. Whether you like it or not, if you want to increase your chances of being successful, which remember is what these six episodes are all about, if you want to increase your chances of being successful, you can start by dressing in a way that attracts and doesn't repel success. This doesn't have to be a suit and tie, of course, just appropriately for the world in which you live and work, and thinking about what would be most likely to bring you success in that environment. Hill touches on this topic in his lesson on enthusiasm, where he talks about being able to wear nice clothes and how it will make you feel better and be more enthusiastic. There he explains that if you look like a million bucks, you'll feel like a million bucks and you will quite likely find yourself around a million bucks. And the opposite is also true, of course, 
and this is to be avoided. I love these little but incredibly telling observations that he has in this book and it is absolutely overflowing with them. One of them in particular that blew my mind was that he takes the time to talk about elements of success that no one would tell you to your face and so he next goes into the topic of personal hygiene. You simply won't be successful if you smell like a rat's backside. Wash yourself, wear deodorant, brush your teeth, Use mouthwash, and if you know you have a problem with sweat or bad breath or whatever, carry the things you need to stay clean and smell good with you. Whether you like it or not, and none of us particularly like it, you also need to regularly attend the dentist. Knowing that your teeth are cared for and that problems with them are fixed gives you much increased confidence. That confidence will be the key for you to open more doors to success. You know what I do almost every day? I wash. Personal hygiene is part of the package with me. Jim Carrey, unquote. Hill also devotes a considerable amount of page space to something I've only vaguely ever thought about. The art of shaking hands. <laughs> he believed that it forms an important part of our personality and points out that like so many other things outlined here, it is an art which can be cultivated. Every trait which goes into your personality, he explains, is under your control, and you can improve it so it will be whatever you want it to be. Helen Keller was the first deaf-blind person to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree. Touch to her was a truly vital sense. She said, the hands of those I meet are dumbly eloquent to me. The touch of some hands is an impertinence. I've met people so empty of joy that when I clasped their frosty fingertips, it seemed as if I were shaking hands with the northeast storm. Others there are whose hands have sunbeams in them, so that their grasp warms my heart. It may be only the clinging touch of a child's hand, but there is as much potential sunshine in it for me as there is in a loving glance for others. A hearty handshake or a friendly letter gives me genuine pleasure. And I get this because I've occasionally shaken someone's hand only to feel it collapse under my light but firm grip, and I describe such handshakes as fish fingers, which amuses me greatly, but I admit that it leaves me with a feeling of discomfort with the person whose squishy fish finger hand I have just shaken. Hill explains his feelings on this one as follows, If there is any one thing that leaves me flat and unfavourably impressed when I'm introduced, it's an extended hand which feels like a piece of cold ham. And there's also the hand crusher, the person that catches you unexpectedly in an iron-like grip that breaks bones. I looked this up on Google, Littlethings.com says the crusher is a handshake that is all about power and aggression. So with all that said, I think that shaking hands is a lost art of prosperity, which is surely worth a little of our 21st century consideration. Napoleon Hill suggests that in general you should make your handshake firm and vibrant, and that if you merely permit the other person to shake your limp, cold, lifeless hand, you are displaying what constitutes a negative personality. And I'm very well aware that today's society would encourage us to dismiss all of this stuff because it's what's inside that counts, our character, which he would agree with, I'm sure, but we would be remiss not to consider the outer elements through which others will perceive and judge us, as this, after all, is a series of lectures about success. What's inside is not the only thing that counts. It's just the one thing that counts more than anything else. And again, here in this chapter, Hill gives multiple examples to prove his point. In one example, he talks about how external appearances, manners, a firm handshake, and a gentle and mesmerizing voice when presented by salespeople, or a salesperson in this particular instance, have won him over, and how if these salespeople with pleasing personalities were to visit him again, he would happily sit down and listen to them for three quarters of an hour, enjoying their company. And I've certainly experienced this sort of thing myself, and this is something which he covers too, incidentally, in Lesson 7, Enthusiasm. 
I'll post a YouTube link in the show notes to show a great example of personality in a salesperson, so go and check that one out. Hill also warns that cheap flattery has just the opposite effect. It repels instead of attracts. Analyse anyone, he says, who does not have a pleasing personality and you will find lacking in the faculties of imagination and cooperation. This lesson emphasises at length the importance of making it your business to take a keen interest in other people and their work, to cultivate and work on your personality and to be aware of your outward appearance. This is simply not something that is discussed these days, other than perhaps a mother nagging a child about looking smart. And I find all this very intriguing because we're talking about success here and if we can consider this when other people do not, it will give us the edge we might need to achieve that success. This year, for the first time ever, I had shirts and hoodies made up with FightDirector.com and Get Carter written on them. I used to joke about having to prove myself on film sets on which I don't know that many people that I should maybe have my CV printed on my t-shirt or a picture of me holding our Cineworld Audience Award which we got at BAFTA Scotland as some people try to sideline you as soon as they meet you as they go through life offering up little or no respect to other people. I've noticed now though with these shirts and the hoodie that things have actually begun to change. People ask me for my number far more often and proving myself to be competent when meeting new crews seems no longer to be a problem. They just accept it. It's written on my back and the fight director, they give me the respect that's due. It's a fascinating subject, this, and that's why I'm going to give it a little bit more time here. (laughs) Now, Hill himself commits considerable time to character building through rigid self-discipline, self-control and auto-suggestion. He provides a formula for character building and lists factors that make a good personality. Here are just a few of those factors. He says that your mental attitude is the most important trait of your personality. This is a trait with which you attract people to you and cause them to like you or you repel them and cause them to dislike you. This is something I went into earlier in the enthusiasm lesson and which permeates the whole book. The next most important trait of your personality consists of your flexibility in mental attitude or your lack of it. If you have flexibility, you adjust yourself to all the circumstances without losing your composure or allowing yourself to become irritable or angry. This is one that I find easier to adopt the older that I get. It's a difficult skill to master though and I'm still a bit of a novice. Hill explains here that you cannot control the actions of other people which might justify you becoming irritated by them but you can control your reaction to all such circumstances by exercising your trait of flexibility. And of course what we're talking about here is self-control which we talked about before. The third most important trait of a pleasing personality is the ability to control and direct your enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is one of the means by which you can give force to your words, but you must be able to turn it on or off at will, and Hill says as definitely as you can turn on and off water at a tap. Uncontrolled enthusiasm often makes people boresome, he says. It also allows others to enter and influence you in ways you do not wish to be influenced, and that's an interesting observation yet again, tagged in almost as a throwaway by Hill in this section. Don't get carried away by your enthusiasm and find yourself committed to someone else's purpose because you got excited. Stay on target and remember, always remember, your definite chief aim. The fourth most important trait of a pleasing personality is sincerity of purpose. The person who is not sincere with others is soon detected and rejected because no one is attracted to the person who deceives others. Possibly my favourite quote of Hill's is this, Sincerity is one quality of character which cannot be successfully faked, not even by the most astute rascal or the most efficient actor. And I'll end with a list of destructive habits which Hill explains will limit your success. One of the most destructive habits which make one's personality objectionable is that of breaking in and running away with the conversation when others are speaking. Next, sarcasm, expressed by insinuations and wisecracks which are not so wise 
are near the head of his list of habits which give you a negative personality. Third, he says vanity expressed by either words or actions is sure to make one unpopular. Fourth, indifference in listening while others are speaking is sure to be noticed and resented. It's more profitable to be a good listener than it is to be a good talker because you're always apt to learn something while listening to others but will never learn anything from hearing yourself. Five, the attempt to flatter where flattery is obviously not deserved will bring quick resentment from others and if they are wise that the flatterer wants something, they will ensure, perhaps, that you do not get it. Six, the habit of finding fault with the world at large and people in general is never a very popular habit and it's no part of a pleasing personality. It's far better to direct conversation to the circumstances and things which are right than to complain of those one believes to be wrong. I recognise that one because I, I know quite a few people that cannot help but talk about the negative in things and I especially notice these people on Twitter etc and you just start shutting them off. And another internet lurker uh, is represented by number seven in the, in the list. One of the very worst habits is that of openly and directly challenging those with whom one may not agree, where there is no obvious reason for doing so except the desire to be on the opposite side. And I know a few people that just can't resist an argument and it's something on which today's internet-fed populace just thrives. For me, though, it just feels like a waste of mental energy energy that could be placed elsewhere into more positive action. And number eight, the habit of volunteering unsolicited advice to others who have not requested it can make you an intolerable bore. Free advice usually is considered to be just what it costs, which is nothing but the patience with which to listen to it. Nine, the habit of speaking of one's physical ailments and personal problems may be tolerated by others, but this habit will never make one welcome or pleasing. <laughs> He's just brilliant. Ten, the habit of endeavouring to convey an impression of superiority through the use of words and topics unfamiliar to others is a surefire destroyer of popularity. Eleven, Envy over those who are successful is a trait which destroys a pleasing personality. The truly great men and women have all been known to be generous, sympathetic and joyous in connection with the good fortunes of others. This is something, again, maybe it's just the world that I work in, I do see this come up again and again and again. Even with actors that are quite successful in their own right or, or crew who have had some success, they always... Certain people always seem to be annoyed that someone else has been more successful than them. And I gave an example in an earlier show of um, Kevin McKidd. Not that he's the problem. Kevin's been very successful, but I met a classmate of his a couple of years after he had left college, because he was a year above me in college, or maybe two years above me. And I met a classmate of his, and Kevin had by that point been in train spotting, uh, and it was before he went on to is it Grey's Anatomy that he was in. But anyway, this chap that was in his uh, in his class was just so bitter, and he wasn't a particularly likable chap anyway. And that one conversation that I had with him, I'd be glad if I never spoke to him again. This this envy of those who are successful thing, which Hill is talking about, is a surefire killer of personality. And the final one on this list, number 12, is slovenliness. Slovenliness, and I had to do a warm-up before I said that twice, slovenliness in body posture and in clothing never attracts but always repels others. Carelessness in body and posture is immediately traceable to a negative mental attitude. Okay, I must move on, but I'll end with this. Hill says that before you can make full use of the master key to success, you will have to make your personality pleasing. This will require courage on your part and honesty with yourself. A pleasing personality stands near the head of the list of assets which will make you truly rich. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Accuracy builds credibility. Jim Rohn, unquote. Lesson 11. Accurate thought. In this lesson, we learn to sort facts from information. 
and use auto-suggestion in conjunction with focused thought. In a gunfight, fast is fine, but when accuracy is everything, you need to take your time in a hurry. Wyatt Earp, unquote. Hill straight off the bat warns us that unless you study this lesson with an open mind, you will miss the very keystone to the arch of this course, and without this stone, you can never complete what he calls your temple of success. And I'll add to that too, because without accurate thought, you're going nowhere. This is not woolly thought, or belief in your own hype, or gullible thought. It's accurate thought, and it involves two fundamentals which all who indulge in it must observe. First, to think accurately you must separate facts from mere information. There is a lot of information available to you that is not based on facts. Don't believe everything you hear on the internet, Abraham Lincoln, unquote. Second, you must separate facts into two classes, the important and the unimportant, or the relevant and the irrelevant. So, all facts which will aid you to any extent whatsoever in the attainment of your definite chief aim are important and relevant, and all that you cannot use are unimportant and irrelevant. Of course, I've covered prioritising many times with things like the focus funnel and the Eisenhower matrix, so this shouldn't be anything new to the regular listener. Focusing on the stuff that really matters is encapsulated very well in that quote of Peter Drucker's who says, It is fundamentally the confusion between effectiveness and efficiency that stands between doing the right things and doing things right. There is surely nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency that which should not be done at all. I've given this quote before as it's a terrific pointer in the world of productivity, and it's worth keeping it close at hand when you're having to make decisions to move you forward. The phrase, work smarter, not harder, possibly originates here in The Law of Success, where Hill writes in regard to successful people that, far from working harder than you, they are perhaps working less and with greater ease by virtue of their having learned the secret of separating the important facts from the unimportant. Hill goes on to talk about other factors in accurate thinking as he talks about idle gossip and believing what one reads in the papers. This is so true about today's world of fake news and internet facts that it could have been written this morning. He warns us too to accept that loose, unsound opinions can be mistaken for accurate thinking but that most opinions are without value because they are based on bias, prejudice, intolerance, guesswork, hearsay evidence and out-and-out ignorance. The accurate thinker will not accept as such all that he sees and hears for the reason that it constitutes the rocks and the reefs on which so many people flounder and go down to defeat in a bottomless ocean of false conclusions. Hill, who trained as a lawyer, talks of a principle called the law of evidence. The object of this law is to get at the facts. Any judge, he says, can proceed with justice to all concerned if they have the facts upon which to base their judgment. But they may play havoc with innocent people if they circumvent the law of evidence and reach a conclusion or judgment that is based upon hearsay information. Hill points out that the more successful a person is, the less they are inclined to express wild unjustified opinions about things. He warns us also that often people he refers to as drifters or failures have an assortment of opinions about everything you can imagine. In his 1954 address he gives us a simple rule to help us avoid being misled by unsound opinions expressed by other people. When you hear someone make a statement which your reason cannot accept, or which you question or should for safety's sake question for any reason whatsoever, ask this simple forward question. How do you know? Stand firm on that question and either force the speaker to identify the source from which they got the information that they are endeavouring to pass on as facts, 
or reject the statement entirely as if it had not been made. That question again was, how do you know this? Or how do you know? Do this no matter who is speaking or what may be his reputation for truth and veracity. Accuracy is the twin brother to honesty and inaccuracy to dishonesty. Nathaniel Hawthorne, unquote. Hill warns us that it is true that most thinking of today, far from being accurate, is based upon the sole foundation of expediency. It's amazing how many people there are who are, in inverted commas, honest only when it is profitable to them, but find myriads of facts to justify themselves in following a dishonest course when that course seems to be the more profitable or advantageous. An example of this could be the directors of companies that give themselves massive bonuses just before their companies collapse, leaving their former employees crying in the streets. Some, usually fair people, will simply lie through their teeth if it is advantageous for them to do so. Thomas Jefferson reminds us all that whenever you do a thing, act as if all the world were watching. So remember that the accurate thinker deals with facts, regardless of how they affect their own interests. For they know that ultimately this policy will bring them out on top, in full possession of the object of their definite chief aim in life. Other points of interest within this lesson include, if one man slanders another, his remarks should be accepted, if of any weight at all, with at least a grain of the proverbial salt of caution, for it is a common human tendency for men to find nothing but evil in those whom they do not like. Next, the moment a man or woman begins to assume leadership in any walk of life, the slanderers begin to circulate rumours and subtle whisperings reflecting upon his or her character. The slanderers killed both Harding and Wilson, he says, murdered them with vicious lies. They did the same to Lincoln, only in a somewhat more spectacular manner, by inciting a fanatic to hasten his death with a bullet. And this was written some 90-odd years ago, remember. Could have been written yesterday. I keep thinking this when I read this stuff. As an accurate thinker, it is both your privilege and your duty to avail yourself of the facts, even though you must go out of your way to get them. If you permit yourself to be swayed to and fro by all manner of information that comes to your attention, you will never become an accurate thinker, and if you do not think accurately, you cannot be sure of attaining your definite chief aim in life. Finally, I believe that this quote sums up much of the lesson in one sentence, so let it guide you. I do not believe I can afford to deceive others. I know I cannot afford to deceive myself. This must be the motto of the accurate thinker. Don't believe the hype, Wycliffe Sean, unquote. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. One reason so few of us achieve what we truly want is that we never direct our focus. We never concentrate our power. Most people dabble their way through life, never deciding to master anything in particular. Tony Robbins, unquote. Lesson 12. Concentration. Learn to fix your attention on a given subject at will, for whatever length of time you choose, and you will have learned the secret passageway to power and plenty. This is concentration. The dictionary defines concentration as the action or power of focusing all one's attention, but Hill takes this much further and attributes concentration to be what he calls the magic key of success. Concentration, in the sense in which it is used here, means the ability, through fixed habit and practice, to keep your mind on one subject until you have thoroughly familiarised yourself with it and mastered it. It means the ability to control your attention and focus on a given problem until you have solved it. And he devotes a considerable amount of time in this lesson to environment, to habits, and to memory. And I won't go into all of this, 
but it's an interesting reading nonetheless. I'd just say on the topic of environment, though, that when my office or my house is untidy, it is usually representative of my own state of mind. So getting on top of housework or office tasks in the sense of cleaning up your environment will, in the end, I believe, make you more productive. You can't break a bad habit by throwing it out the window. You've got to walk it slowly down the stairs. Mark Twain, unquote. To find another way, Hill's concentration is the ability to throw off the effects of bad habits and the power to build new habits that are more to your liking. It means complete self-mastery. The ability to think as you wish to think. The ability to control your thoughts and direct them to a definite end. And the ability to organise your knowledge into a plan of action that is sound and workable. As a productivity podcaster, this is a virtual snapshot of probably 40 or 50% of all the advice that is out there on getting things done. For Napoleon Hill, desire is the starting point of all achievement and he states that ambition and desires are the chief factors which enter into the act of successful concentration. Without them, he says, the magic key, or concentration, is useless. And he says that we must not underestimate the power of concentration just because it did not come clothed in mysticism or because it is described in simple language. All great truths are simple in final analysis and easily understood. If they are not, then they are not great truths. Use this magic key with intelligence and only for the attainment of worthy ends and it will bring you enduring happiness and success. Forget the mistakes you've made and the failures you've experienced. Quit living in the past for do you not know that your yesterdays never return? Unquote. Start all over again if your previous efforts have not turned out well and make your next five or ten years tell a story of success that will satisfy your most lofty ambitions. Make a name for yourself and render the world a great service through ambition, desire and concentrated effort. You can do it if you believe you can. Most people lack ambition and desire nothing in particular, but if your desire is strong and your ambition within reason, the magic key of concentration will help you attain it. No unbeliever, Hill warns us though, ever enjoyed the benefits of the magic key. So I've covered a lot of ground today, an awful lot of ground today, (laughs) and it's but a drop in the ocean of the content of the book. But let me recap. Lesson 10, a pleasing personality. His advice is have one. And if you don't have one, cultivate one. Mediocrity does not care if you're pleasant or not. Success does. Lesson 11, accurate thought. Separate facts from mere information. Then separate your facts into two classes, the important and the unimportant, or the relevant and the irrelevant. All facts, which will aid you to any extent whatsoever in the attainment of your definite chief aim, are important and relevant. All that you cannot use are unimportant and irrelevant. Lesson 12. Concentration. Concentration is the act of focusing the mind upon a given desire until the ways and means for its realisation have been worked out and successfully put into operation. Hill describes concentration as the magic key to success. The easiest person to deceive is oneself, Edward Bulwer-Lytton, unquote. One of the many important points I covered today was about accurate thought. Don't get bogged down in your own hype and don't deceive yourself. If you've been failing to achieve success in something, I want you to ask yourself this question. Why? Once you have an answer to this, you have a chance at solving your problem. That's today's call to action.
The next episode will be the penultimate in this series within the series of the Law of Success, and I hope you'll join me for more mind-expanding lessons from Napoleon Hill's incredible book. In the show notes this week, I'm going to make available for download the audio from the film that Mr. Hill made in 1954. I'm not sure how I'll deliver it, but it will be there. If I can figure out the legalities of it, I'll make it available as part of the podcast too. Uh, but it might be that you have to go and actually download to listen to it. By 1954, though, Hill had refined his laws of success quite considerably, and it's an interesting listen on the back of what I've been talking about here. Lastly, I'd like to thank James at uh, Shug the Dog Productions for sponsoring this and the previous show. It's very much appreciated. He's been working on a podcast of his own, which I think is called Shipyard Shenanigans, and I'm sure somewhere down the line you'll see me asking you to go and listen to it as well. That's a, a kind of drama comedy bit of fun, though it's not uh, a productivity one. So it's been another long lesson and I want to get on to a final thought. So I'm going to hand over to Stephen Keshi for this one. He said, people don't have to believe in you for you to succeed. Just work hard and when you succeed, they will believe. Now take control of your own destiny. Keep on shooting. And join me next time on Film Pro Productivity. The music that you can hear right now is Adventures by Ehumitsu. You can view the show notes for this episode on the official website at filmproproductivity.com. You can follow my personal accounts on Twitter and Instagram at fight underscore director. Or follow the show on Twitter at FilmProProdPod or Facebook at FilmProProductivity. Please support the show by subscribing, spreading the word and leaving an awesome review. <laughs>